Well, this is Jonathan Gray calling from New Zealand. Um, Dr. Bill, uh, I hope you're having a well-earned break and a uh, good one. And I brought my wife Josephine online with me tonight, tonight because, um, or this afternoon over in the USA because um, she's going to ask me some questions. We've been going through over the last few months uh, my book written for sceptics called The Forbidden Secret. And today we're going to deal with the information in Chapter 34. Can we depend on the New Testament? Are the events recorded real history? Have the documents been changed over time? Can we rely upon what we're reading as the original uh, works of those who wrote it? So, um, Josephine, would you like to say hello to the listeners today? Hi, everyone. Even though I can't see you, um, welcome to the show. Well, now, Josephine, you've got a question for me, and, and perhaps we will get into that straight away. Yes, Jonathan. There are um, critics who claim you cannot trust the New Testament, let alone the whole Bible, because it was forged in key places uh, by the Roman Emperor Constantine and his Council of Bishops in the 4th century. What is the truth about that? Well, to be honest, Josephine, it's an incredible thing that there are some otherwise intelligent fellows out there choking on this myth like a dog on a bone. And I'd like to say to any critics, who, any skeptics who are pushing this theory, come on, guys, let's get real. There are only about 45 surviving Greek manuscripts of the New Testament that are the fruit of Constantine's project, and that represents only a mere 1% of all ancient manuscripts of the New Testament. And what is more, these represent only one tiny geographical area, Alexandria, Egypt. That was the center of pagan philosophy. Now, it was corrupted manuscripts from like Alexandria, ma manuscripts of a man called Origen, actually, that Constantine adopted in Rome for his project. Now, as we get into this, it will become clear that there were two streams of manuscripts, a very tiny minority that were corrupted and the vast majority that were preserved carefully and have come down to us. Now, the, the minority was messed up by a superpower in a bid for total spiritual and political control, and that sabotage was centered first in Alexandria and then transferred to Rome. Now, just two centuries after Constantine's time, the church in Rome began to rule Europe, and what we know as the Dark Ages came on. And a major suppression kept the unchanged manuscripts out of the reach of most Europeans. But the truth is that the majority of New Testament manuscripts had nothing to do with Constantine's capers. And that means that 99% of all surviving Greek manuscripts of the New Testament have come down to us untainted. Now, while the scriptures were suffering corruption in Alexandria and Rome, the unchanged text was being preserved very, very carefully in many, many places where the corruptors could not reach. And this was largely known as the Peshitta, or the Syriac Aramaic text. And today, the vast majority of surviving manuscripts are from this source. And so that's why it's called the majority text, or the traditional text. But you don't hear critics talk about this, do you? Not very much. And why not? Well, I can think of two reasons. Uh, for some of them, it may be a bit they don't know. But there are others who are lying to us. So you just take your pick. Now, if we go right back to history, when the Christians fled from Jerusalem, which was the initial world headquarters of Christianity, and when they fled from this in AD 66, just before the destruction by the Romans, they made their way first to a little place called Pelar across the other side of the Jordan, and then from there they went up to Antioch. And this became the new world headquarters of the Christian movement. And a version of Aramaic called Syriac Aramaic was the common language of the Galilee region of the first century. And so probably it was the language of the majority of the New Testament writers. And it's a fact, absolute fact, that 
an ancient Aramaic New Testament manuscript, it does exist. And it has been in continuous use since ancient times by the Christians of the East. Now, that may not be generally known, but it's a fact. In the same original language, the New Testament was first written. Oh, yes, that's right, Josephine. The apostles would have written their books first in Hebrew or Aramaic, the official languages of the synagogue. But this would not have stopped them almost immediately translating them into what became known as Koine Greek, which was the common language of the day spoken throughout the Roman Empire. And uh, in the reign of the Roman Emperor Aurelian, uh, bishops from Rome and Alexandria visited Antioch in an attempt to press their Romanized teachings. Now, there was a fellow in the Christian college at Antioch called Lucian, and he noticed that the scriptures they brought were substantially different. He saw that they had taken unwarranted license in removing and adding pages to the manuscripts of the Bible. So, as a counter to this, Lucian certified the apostolic originals without any change in the Aramaic language of the common people. And he also translated the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek. Now, the churches of the Syrian area have always used this common language, Peshitta Bible. In fact, there's never been a time when these churches did not use it. And so Lucian's Bible was preserved through most of the East. Now, as uh, Christianity advanced into Asia, copies of the Peshitta were eagerly sought by uh, those who were taking it eastward into Persia, Armenia, India, China, Japan, and other places. And this region of the world was separated from the West for a thousand years, and they were naturally ignorant of the many of the novelties introduced by the, the councils and decrees of Rome. And in these regions, copies of the Syriac scriptures found quite a safe asylum from search and destruction, and they retained their purity. Now, when we compare these with our present text of the New Testament, particularly the King James uh, Bible, we find that they agree. And even proponents of the critical text will generally admit that fact. So, so what do we find here? We find that the Syrian Church of the Apostles, one of the earliest churches of the Christian era, was using a translation of the New Testament that matches our traditional text, our majority text. Well, uh, could I suggest that this speaks in, in thunder tones that the traditional text was the true text of the New Testament and its roots go right back to the original autographs of the Apostles. Now, not only in the East was the, the true text preserved, but also in parts of the West. Now, Paul and the other original apostles had spread the Christian message through the Roman Empire. And uh, in particular, there were Latin communities in northern Italy and numerous Celtic communities <clears throat> of Asia Minor and Western Europe, such as England, Scotland, Ireland, and so on. And up in the French Alps, there was what we call the Italic or pre-Waldensian church. And they received the New Testament from uh, missionary groups that came from Antioch. And they were formed officially into a church about AD 120. That's pretty early. And that's less than 100 years after most of the books of the New Testament were written. Now, they were called Waldenses because they lived up in the valleys, and that's, that's what the meaning of the name is. The, the remote mountain valley isolated them from the influence of what was going on in Rome. And uh, they were among the first group in Europe, actually, to obtain a translation of the Bible in their own language. Now, can we get down to the music of... Okay. Well, Josephine, mm -hmm. are you ready with your next question? Sure. Okay. Josephine, I'm, I believe you have another question that you'd like to ask. Yes. I'd like to get to the nitty-gritty of what the New Testament contains. We sometimes hear it said that Jesus is just a made-up story. Some say he never existed. Others say he did exist. Yet the story that Jesus rose from the dead is not true. 
people just do not rise from the dead. The story was invented many years later by his followers after the true facts were forgotten. What do you say to that, Jonathan? Well, I'd like to say that in coming broadcast, that that's our next broadcast on this, uh, we'll get into evidences for the resurrection. But to answer your question more specifically today, uh, assuming that Jesus never existed, or that he did not rise from the dead, my question to any sceptic would be, what was the catalyst that launched Christianity? What cause can you pinpoint to explain the historical fact that Christianity grew so fast in the region where first the events were supposed to have happened, that it spoke of, and then it transformed the whole world of the first century so quickly. Now, when you consider that Christianity was so exclusivist and it frowned on compromise with other religions, that would mean that its odds of success were pretty poor. Uh, in fact, its proponents were often called to face death for their claims, and thousands of them did. Now, so we've got to be realistic about this. The Christian movement just didn't happen. There had to be a definite cause. They turned the world upside down in their day. So what was the cause? Well, I submit that it was nothing less than an actual event that they believed in and they were willing to die for. And they said that that event was the resurrection of Jesus, that they had witnessed it. That witnessed the risen Jesus after his death, and his death was confirmed very easily by, by what happened around at, at that time. The resurrection of the divine Jesus from the dead was the explanation that the Christians gave for their existence. And that belief was their driving force. Now, so the skeptic needs to explain how this Christian movement got started and what drove it if it wasn't what they claimed. Now, it's a fact that we know more about the details of the events immediately before and after the actual death of Jesus in and near Jerusalem than we know about the death of any other one man in all the ancient world. Think about that. The historicity of many other characters from the ancient world we accept, don't we, on much less evidence than that, often merely just because of the single appearance of a name, and we accept that. Well, Christianity is well grounded in the facts of history. It's well attested history. It's a document of demonstrated accuracy. You can trust its writings. A well-known writer, David Icke, says the New Testament was fraudulently composed by a Roman family long after the supposed events of Jesus' life. He says that a family by the name of Tissa wrote it between um, 60 A.D. and 138 A.D. That's a hundred years after the supposed time of Jesus. How do you answer that one, Jonathan? Well, you know, for the establishment of an historical fact, Josephine, no documents are more valuable than contemporary letters, especially letters by eyewitnesses. Now, for a start, we have the letters of Paul, the Apostle, who was an enemy of Christianity to start with. And his epistles constitute good historical evidence. He wrote to people in Galatia, in Turkey. He wrote to people in Corinth, in Rome, and, and other places. And about the authenticity and date of these, there's no dispute, or very little dispute today. These letters belong to the time of Paul's missionary journeys, and we can date them very closely to the period 55 to 58 AD. And this brings the evidence of witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus still nearer the event. We have a short span here of only 25 years from the event. Is it possible that the New Testament writers developed myths and wrote them into the Gospels? Stories such as the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and Jesus being God? Oh, that's a fair question. Uh, now, may I ask a question? If the original gospel reports were just myth, could a mere myth have gained such acceptance and had the impact it did if there was no basis of truth in it? I mean, is it likely that a book describing alleged public events that occurred 30 or 40 years previously could have been accepted? if its stories 
of these unusual occurrences were false or mythical. Let, let's do a parallel here. This would be as fantastic as for me to write a biography of, say, Ronald Reagan, President of the USA. And in that, to say he claimed to be God, that he claimed to forgive people's sins, that he claimed to have risen from the dead. Oh, look, come on, let's, let's not be so, so foolish as to uh, have a story like that would never get off the ground, because there were too many witness, witnesses around who knew Reagan. Even today there are people alive who knew him. Uh, or shall we come down to George Bush's time? No one today would publish a biography of George Bush's White House days full of public event anecdotes, which never happened. They would soon be contradicted. They would never be accepted and passed off as true by the population. And likewise, I suggest to you that there's no way in which the New Testament writers could have got away with pure fabrication, because there were plenty of eyewitnesses. It just won't bear scrutiny that Jesus is just a myth. Well, now, we might ask, how long does it take for a myth to develop? Historians agree that it takes, usually, two generations at least. Now, we've already established the very early dating of the Gospels, and substantial myths could never have developed in just a brief time because hostile witnesses would have served as a corrective if false claims were going around. Uh, Dr. Sherwin White's a pretty uh, uh, well-respected authority on uh, gratio roman history. Uh, he, he has been teaching at Oxford University in years by, and he insists that the passage of two generations was not even enough time for a legend to develop and wipe out a collared a core of historical truth that would already be well known before the legend developed. But wait a minute. Is it possible that the New Testament writers only pretended to be living close to the events? An author writing a hundred years or more after an alleged event could write anything, and people might believe him. Do you have any specific evidence as to how early after the time of Jesus the New Testament books were written? Yes, I, we do have evidence, and I'm glad to say. Uh, the idea of a fully divine Jesus who worked miracles and rose from the dead was being proclaimed during the very first decade of Christianity. I'm saying within 10 years of the time. And at that time, thousands were accepting it as a real event that had just occurred. Okay, so if the whole thing was made up, uh, how could that be true? I, I think after the break we'll get in a, one or two examples of this so that we've got something solid to stick our teeth into. Well, the question was asked that um, do we have any evidence as to how early, after the time of Jesus, the uh, New Testament books were written? Well, I'd like to give a few witnesses to this. Um, an Egyptian witness to start with. Uh, in 80, 180 AD, a man called Pantanius went to India. There, there was a large Jewish colony on the far side of the Ganges River. And you know, he discovered descendants of converts that had been made by the Apostle Bartholomew. In fact, in their possession, they showed him the Gospel of Matthew in Hebrew characters, which Bartholomew had left with them in the year 57 AD. Now, that's only 26 years after the uh, recorded resurrection of Jesus. Pantanius spent several months with these people, and then he returned by ship to Egypt, and he took back the gospel with him to Egypt. Uh, then we have testimony from Armenia, from the Romans, and others. Uh, up in Armenia, a historian records... Armenian historian, he says, Christianity was preached in Armenia by the Apostles Thaddeus and Bartholomew in the first century, first half of the first century. Both these men were murdered for the witness they gave. Thaddeus was martyred in AD 43, Bartholomew in AD 60. Uh, back in India, we have another w interesting witness, this time on the west coast of India, uh, independent records kept of the arrival of Jesus' apostle Thomas. The Indians claimed that Thomas landed at Cranganore on the Malabar coast in July 52. 
And even now, each year, they celebrate the anniversary of his landing. In fact, uh, the government of India in 1964 produced a stamp picturing Thomas to commemorate his arrival on the coast of Malabar in July 52 AD. So uh, that's, that's uh, an independent witness to the early uh, fact of the Gospels being promoted by the apostles in different parts of the world. Now, uh, we've all heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls, but most people don't know that among the Qumran caves of Israel in 1947 were found, among those scrolls, 19 portions of Mark's Gospel, and these had been dated at 50 AD. It's also recorded that Mark took the news of Jesus' death and resurrection to Egypt within 15 years after the event in 46 AD. That brings it much closer, within 15 years of the resurrection of Jesus. You mentioned that there was evidence supplied by the um, pagan Roman writers. Uh, do you want to comment on that? Oh, yes, I'd be happy to. Uh, the Roman historian Tacitus, uh, who lived from 52 to 120 AD, wrote a number of detailed histories. In fact, he's probably the best uh, historian of Roman times that we have today. And uh, he wrote uh, the Annals of Imperial Rome, in which he speaks of a great fire in Rome that took place under Nero in July 64 AD. And he tells us that thousands of Christians were executed for their faith. And uh, then we have uh, the historian Suetonius, who uh, lived from 69 to 140 AD. He informs us that the Emperor Claudius expelled Jews from Rome in 49 AD because of trouble caused by followers of one who called himself Christ, their leader. So here we have 49 AD, uh, thousands of Christians, uh, and that's 18 years after the alleged resurrection of Jesus. We're getting close to the, the real events here. Uh, there's not a large gap between the real events and thousands of people who are following the, the knowledge of it. Is there any other evidence to indicate that the New Testament books were written quite early? Yes. Um, well, why don't I mention Sir William Ramsey? He was a skeptic. He'd been taught by his critical professors, and he believed that the New Testament book of Acts, written by Luke, was a fraud product of the mid-second century. Well, he became one of the greatest archaeologists of all time. He was honoured with doctorates from nine universities, and eventually he was knighted for his contributions to scholarship. As a result of 30 years of intensive research, Ramsey was forced to do a complete reversal of his beliefs, which led him to testify ultimately that Luke's history is unsurpassed in its trustworthiness, and he even called him the greatest of all historians. I would suggest that the same assessment applies to all New Testament writers. They were very careful historians. And another uh, foremost uh, Middle Eastern archaeologist is William Fox Albright. And his verdict is that every book of the New Testament was written very probably sometime between 50 and 75 AD. But I would go further than that because we've got further research now which suggests that the whole of the New Testament was written before the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. Now, if anyone wants to check up on some of this, um, my book, The Forbidden Secret, which we're taking from Chapter 34 today, uh, goes into quite a bit of detail about this, and uh, this is good information for any skeptic who would like to know the truth. Prove all things. Now, um, yeah, well, we could keep going on that particular question, Josephine, but I think maybe that's enough for now. Okay. Despite the uh, early dating of the Gospels in the first century, um, there is a time gap between Jesus and the writing of the Gospels, several years during which the account um, would have to be memorized and transmitted orally. Surely oral memory cannot accurately preserve accounts, Jonathan, from person to person for many years. What I'm saying is this. In the years before they were written down, could the facts have been remembered accurately enough to be uh, reliable? Well, that's a good question. 
it requires us to ask how reliable is the oriental memory. Well now, uh, down in our part of the world, we have a, a lot of Polynesians, South Pacific Islanders, in particular Maoris here in New Zealand. And uh, there's an interesting uh, record left behind by these people. The Polynesian explorer Cooper visited New Zealand around 925 AD. Now, for 200 years, his story was told and retold orally during generation after generation. And based upon that oral passing down of information, an expedition from Tahiti headed for New Zealand and they landed directly in the same coastal inlet that Coupe had described, all from instructions passed down orally for 200 years. So, And likewise, I could say, the Oriental memory is wonderfully retentive. In fact, all Jewish education used to consist of rote memory. Entire books were memorized word for word. And uh, not only that, but Jesus himself uh, used teaching forms that encourage memorization. He had a very easy to memorize structure for many of his sayings. Anyway, there are sufficient parallels in Judaism to show that the disciples could have transmitted the stories of Jesus' word perfect. But, you know, oral memory, Josephine, wasn't actually necessary uh, totally because um, we have a man recorded who came in and he wrote one of the books of the New Testament, Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector before this. And after he left his own his old life, he brought some things with him, his pen and his ability to write. Because as a tax collector, he was able to write both in his native Hebrew or Aramaic and Greek. And he also had a, a form of shorthand he would have learned, which enabled him to make quick down assessments and write down very quickly um, the merchandise that was placed in front of him for taxing purposes. Are you saying that shorthand method of writing was used back in the first century? Oh yes, shorthand was used. Uh, in fact, the system of shorthand had been devised in 63 BC uh, for tracking down speeches made by Cicero and other men, and it was carried on. And the system of shorthand was devised in 63 BC for taking down speeches. So shorthand was well known. In fact, it was uh, it remained in Roman schools in use for more than a thousand years. And Matthew, as a tax collector, would have known something about that. He could have taken down Jesus' sayings quite easily. And apart from that, we have the Oriental memory, which uh, was word perfect. All right, Jonathan, how can we be certain that the New Testament we possess today has not been altered during the past 2,000 years. How can we know for sure that it is the same as was originally written? Well, today the number of available manuscripts from ancient times of the New Testament is overwhelmingly greater than those of any other work of ancient literature. Uh, for quantity, the New Testament comes first. 24,970 manuscripts. Now the next, uh, the next piece of literature for quantity is Homer's Iliad, which has 643. So no documents of the ancient world are as well attested, bibliography, as the New Testament. So to deny the text of the New Testament is really to dismiss the validity of the entire written ancient history of mankind because none of it has such an abundance of witnesses as the New Testament does. The importance of the sheer number of manuscripts copies cannot be overstated, Josephine. I noticed that a critic has claimed that no New Testament manuscript fragment is older than the 4th century. Would you care to comment on that? What is the um, oldest New Testament manuscript still in existence? And uh, what time span exists between the original autograph copy and the oldest copy that has survived? Well, uh, that's an interesting one. The oldest is a piece of the Gospel of Mark on a fragment of the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
And uh, this is known as uh, a, uh, a piece that was found uh, dated to between 50 and uh, a cave 7, actually, between uh, BC 50 and AD 50, and using accepted methods of papyrology and paleography, it's been dated to have been written in AD 50. Now, there's also a strong tradition that Mark took the news of Jesus' death and resurrection to Alexandria as early as 46 AD. So it would appear quite reasonable for Mark to have written his report at least as early as 45 AD while, while eyewitnesses were still around of the event. It doesn't leave any time for embellishment of the records. And uh, even without this Dead Sea manuscript to Mark, the cumulative evidence still places the New Testament within the first century during the lives of eyewitnesses. We have another manuscript, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, dated to 66 AD. So here's two manuscripts, one dated at 50 AD, one at 66 AD, and these are physical manuscripts that we can examine today. So uh, the general integrity of this received text may be regarded as finally established. The facts are now beyond dispute. So I, I would say that that's, that's a pretty good uh, piece of evidence, and we, we can't throw that away. All right, Johnson. But what about the uh, gap in time between the originals that no longer exist and the oldest copies we have? What is the uh, time gap? Well, that's a, you know, a fair question. Well, let's we, we compare this with other ancient authors. We've talked about Homer. Now, do you know the oldest complete preserved text of Homer goes back only to the 13th century? So there's a time gap from Homer to the oldest preserved text of at least 2,200 years. But we don't dispute that Homer wrote that. Now, let's look at Matthew and Mark. We just mentioned the oldest surviving copy of part of Matthew was 66 AD, and the original of Matthew can be shown to have been written around about 37 AD. So there's a gap of only 29 years. The oldest Mark Gospel, 50 AD, among the Dead Sea Scrolls, the original 45 AD, a gap of only five years. Not 2,200 years in these two cases, only 29 years and five years. So what do we have? Two things. One, the overwhelming number of manuscripts, and secondly, their proximity to the originals. I think that's pretty watertight. Jonathan, you uh, wrote somewhere that if all the New Testament was lost, we could reconstruct virtually all of it word perfect from independent sources. Um, would you please explain that? Oh, I'd be happy to, yes. Um, as a cross-check to the early dating of the Gospels, we have other first century books that quote from them. Uh, I'll, I'll name a few of these. One is the Epistle of Barnabas, written in the first century. Uh, another is the Didache. Uh, third one is Clement's Corinthians. Uh, I can think of another one too. There's Ignatius Seven Epistles. Now, in these books, quotations from the New Testament are so numerous and so widespread that if no manuscripts of the New Testament had ever survived, the New Testament could be reproduced from the writings of these other documents alone, which quote from it. You mean if the New Testament had been destroyed and every copy of it lost by the end of the 3rd century, could it have been collected together again from the writings of, the, uh, of other early Christians? Oh, yes, indeed, most certainly. Uh, you could find the entire New Testament quoted by these first century writings and going up to second, third century, except for 11 verses. Now, going back to the earliest ones of these, we have Clement, uh, who lived from 30 AD to 95. He actually became the second bishop of the early church in Rome. It's interesting that Rome was not founded by St. Peter. Rome was founded by Paul. And the first bishop of the church in Rome was not Peter. It was a man called Linus, who was a British captive in Rome. And he became the first bishop. Now, the second bishop is Clement. And he intimately knew the apostles Paul and Peter and others of the original apostles. 
and he quotes extensively from the New Testament, so we, we know what the New Testament contained by his writings. We also have Ignatius, who lived from 70 to 110, and he became a bishop in Antioch in Syria, and he lost his life for sticking to his faith. Now, he knew all the apostles, and he was also a disciple of Polycarp. Now, Polycarp was a direct disciple of the Apostle John. So Ignatius, a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of the Apostle John, that's pretty close. He quotes from the Gospel of Matthew, from John, from Acts, from Romans, from 1 Corinthians, from Galatians, from Ephesians, from Philippians, from Colossians, from the book of 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, James and Peter, all those New Testament books. Uh, getting to Polycarp himself. Uh, he uh, was born AD 70. He was martyred when he was 86 years of age for his faith. And he became a bishop of Smyrna. And he was a direct disciple of the Apostle John. He gives us lots of quotations from the New Testament. And then we have Barnabas uh, around AD 70 and Hermas around AD 95. So we've got every attesting early Christian writer from the early period, the first century, and followed by those in the second and third centuries who quote the New Testament and can be perceived to be dated manuscripts themselves as independent authorities. And the combined evidence of several of these becomes simply unchallengeable. So I'd say, Josephine, and, and to all of you listeners, that uh, if you didn't have the original New Testament, you could just about reconstruct it from all the quotations made by these people in the early years. I'd like to thank uh, everyone for uh, listening to this broadcast. Um, and I'd like to ask Jonathan um, as to where can the people get a copy of this book if they haven't got it yet? Well, uh, we go to uh, www.beforeus.com that's B-E-F-O-R-E-U-S dot com and you'll have access to the Forbidden Secret at that, um, at that website. And uh, what I suggest is that there are any sceptics out there and I, I'm a sceptic myself at heart um, go and get this book test it, test the evidence and see if it doesn't uh, give you something to think about, about the reliability of the New Testament and the historicity of Jesus Christ as the Son of God <laughs>